Okay, so hi Ryan. Um, Hello, thanks for, Lubish. Thanks for another wonderful question and answer session. And I'm sure that um, as we share this information, which has become a practical life application for me, not just conceptual, not just ideological, but practically livable and as a consequence transformation. I'm sure that this can help so many viewers because this is really what the world needs right now. We've been through quite a traumatic two years of COVID and now post COVID and people are living very mistrustfully of each other. Work environment, people are still afraid that subconscious fear is still there. What if I get sick? What if I die? What happens to my family? All of those deep subconscious consequential effects of fear, deep rooted fear. And this needs to be released. This needs to be forgiven in order for us to passionately, knowingly pour ourselves inspired, inspirationally into, into what, we, what we do and what we are. So um, please ask away. Sure, Luish, my question is specifically around the process and practice of forgiveness. And in the Ho Oponopono context, right, cleaning the data constantly and how this plays into what I find to be a, a challenging but incredible topic and responsibility of taking total responsibility for our reality. Yeah, beautifully um, explained, Ryan. Um, it's a, we have to, so the end result of what I'm about to explain is exactly that, taking full responsibility for our reality. And that reality has to be an inspired, passion-filled reality as opposed to a reality filled with remorse or an apprehension, fear of what next, what's about to happen. Mm. And the way I, 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 I went about gaining this understanding, this full knowing, it took 30 odd years of my, my life. It was really only towards my late thirties where I really consciously understood the benefits of forgiveness and consequently the positive exchange that forgiveness brings. So I'll start off by saying, we have to make a clear distinction between forgiveness and true forgiveness. Now I'll talk conceptually. What the world often calls forgiveness is you've done me wrong. I want to be the better person. So I will forgive you because I'm the better person. So from a place of advantage, mm -hmm. I, the better person forgives you. And that is false forgiveness. True forgiveness is always a glad exchange. And what I mean by glad exchange, forgiveness has an immediate benefits. It benefits you immediately in a conscious, understanding way. And so true forgiveness ultimately ends up with realizing that nothing's actually happened. Nothing's actually been done to me. I am not a victim of the world I see. I'm not a victim of X, Y, Z. I'm not a victim of my circumstance, of my parents. I'm not a victim of the programming, their prejudices, which became my own. I consciously and willingly chose to come into this form 
this body-mind form to transcend the false beliefs about myself and what I am and where I am. And everything that has happened to me has happened for me, through me, for my benefit, for the benefit of me getting to a place where I consciously and happily, joyously know myself as the very essential nature, the very essence of joy itself, wanting to passionately create from a place of joy and not create from a place of wanting. Mm-hmm. That's what ben, what that's the true benefits of of forgiveness. It has such a beneficial experience for us that it's so vital that it becomes the foundation for all positive inspired living. So, what is true forgiveness? True forgiveness is clearing of the misperceived, misconceived identity with what we are. And this identity starts as we have projected into physical form, as we are born into physical bodies. And as we get into our formative learning years, as the young child, age three and a half, four, five, six, up until eight years old, we start to become programmed by those who raise us, their belief systems, their prejudices, their fears. So let's think of very simple ones. So our parents may be prejudicial towards a certain lifestyle or a certain race of people Mm. or a certain belief about money. You know, you hear the the common one is money doesn't grow on trees, you know, You have to save every penny, switch the lights off, you're wasting water. You know, there's people starving, you know, finish your food because you're ungrateful. You're ungrateful because there's people out there starving. And, you know, um, you start building these negative beliefs about yourself, your body, mind identification. If you're lucky and you're born into a well-to-do educated family, you start to believe that education is the only way that you can be successful. And that everybody without an education is unworthy. Or if you're raised in a well-to-do, non-academic family, you learn that working hard is the only way. And, you know, you're only rewarded when you work really hard or you sacrifice. Sacrifice is a way to be rewarded. And so these are negative patterns that develop at a very young formative years. Then when we watch the interaction between those people that raise us, let's say our parents, mother, father, the behavior that they have towards each other is the father role dominant, is the mother dominant. You have two same-sex parents. Who plays the more dominant role? Um, or do you have a single parent? And, and, you know, is it a mother, a single mother, or is it a single father? Do you have siblings? And what's your relationship to siblings, mother, father, the person that raises you? And what is their belief? And you start to buy into them, the sins of the father. You start to build in into your psyche their evaluations, their value systems, which often are very limiting, especially when it comes to some old dogmatic religious beliefs where you believe in sin and punishment and and issues around sexuality or or sex itself. It's dirty or it's something not good. And um, it's okay if boys do that but it's not okay if girls do that. You start buying into all these sexist beliefs and ideologies, and these become your programming. You then go out into the world, and as a young teenager, you start to form groups based on identification. Often it's around music and fashion and culture, and those prejudices are built in, and either you're actually rebelling against your parents in your young teen years, 12, 13, 14, 16, 18, depending on on your culture and environment, you start to rebel against your parents' value systems and they push back. And if you rebel against value systems, there's a punishment often, or there's a, there's a taking away from. There's always a 
losing off something. And so these, you start to very quickly realize as you try and assess yourself within your teenage peers, there's a ranking order, there's a pecking order. There's, there's a value system based on, on how we look, on how we sound, on how we think. If you intellectualize, you get put into a group. If you're very sporty into another group, if you're musical. So we start a segment and there's, there's benefits and consequence to every action. You learn in science, every action is an equal and opposite reaction, not necessarily positive. And so these formative years start to become our filters through which we see the world. And because we see the world through our filters, they become self-fulfilling filters. Our beliefs become self-fulfilling. We go looking for the answer based on what we believe is true. Luckily for some, you have an inner rebellion. There's an inner rebellion happening where you rebel against authority or authoritative beliefs. And so if you're lucky enough to be that way, you go and challenge. And you, if you're lucky enough to be that way, you go and challenge and look for alternative, stronger values, stronger beliefs that enhance the life experience. And we have, we, if you are consciously aware of what you're doing, you start to realize the patterns that I experienced at the age of five, six, seven, eight, I'm repeating it, 15, 16, 17, 18. And as we move into our young adult lives and we get into relationship, we start to realize that we, that our prejudices and our value systems start impacting on all our relationships. And of course, that you move into a partner and they've got their own value systems and you hadn't maybe considered them. And as you, and as you jostle for position in a relationship, which happens naturally in young relationships, you know, one wants to get power over the other try and project our life desires onto each other. And of course comes the disappointments. And if you're consciously aware, you're able to give and take. There's a compromise and there's a sharing and there's a growing together. But if you're still trying to figure yourself out in your early 20s, late 20s, early 30s, it starts to become conflict, especially if you have two very strong resolves, two very strong identities, two strong egos, because they've identified with values, beliefs, and never, never mind body identification. And, and then all the, all the trophies we've accumulated along the way, all the, the pals we've, you know, the rank through education and, and learning, and those start becoming foundations of what we believe we are. And it's going to be challenged by everything and everyone. And you start to realize the world is filled with a myriad of value systems as cultures and countries take on certain values and, and, and identifications. It all challenges you. And as we move into our thirties, these things start replaying and they come back as incredibly harsh lessons. And so, what are we forgiving? We're forgiving the perceiving of the past in the present. All the data, we're clear. what is forgiveness? It's clearing of data. What is the data? The past trauma, the debilitating beliefs and value systems that hamper us from living out our passionate nature. Someone, the example, someone is creative. They want to be artistic. They want to paint. They want to be musical. And the parents were surgeons or doctors, or lawyers, and they push that child into, into their profession. And yet what the child really wants to do is explore music or art. And so they may be intelligent enough, become the doctor, become the lawyer. But what they really want to do is express their creative nature. And so past thoughts hold us back because they've programmed us. And if past thoughts are traumatic, hurt, abuse, rejection, abandonment, infidelity, verbal abuse, physical abuse. Those scar our psyche, our inner belief of self. And we bring that past into the present. And because we are projectors of our reality, what we see in the world is an outer, outer projection of an inner state of mind. 
And so because of our beliefs and value systems are self prophesying, self fulfilling, we then view the world through our filters and the world matches our belief systems. And we start to become fearful that our past will be recreated. Our hurtful traumatic past, our trauma, our pain, our suffering, episodes of abuse, rejection, abandonment, loneliness will be re will repeated in the, in the future. Why? Because it's the only way we can see the world. We are seeing the world through our very solidified filters of belief and value. And belief and value filled with trauma, pain, suffering, filled with what we don't want. And yet the desire to be ourselves knowingly and passionately and lovingly still pours out. So we still search, if, especially if we have the courage. If we don't, we give up and we become pawns on a chessboard played by a hand whose intentions are very different to you. You become a pawn in a company run by a chief executive or an owner that has a certain vision and you're simply a pawn and your, your input is valued as long as it's a positive input and a positive contribution. And should you challenge the status quo or the belief, you're no longer wanted and you're on thin ice and you could lose your job. And so human beings sit with these debilitating fears which is simply the, the past memory thoughts played out present, presently. And of course, what we feel is what we attract. And so as we play out those thoughts presently, we're projecting them into the future. And that's what come back, comes back at us. So clearing the data is essential. And what does clearing the data mean? It means forgiving the past. And the only way that can happen is when you realize how has all of these debilitating beliefs, values, and traumatic experiences, how do they serve me? How has it served me? What have I learned from it? What is the positive gain that I have from these experiences? Well, obviously, the first one would be, and I want to repeat them again. Two, what have I learned about myself through these traumas, through these patterns and beliefs? Perhaps I've learned that I'm not those beliefs that there is something beyond that. Perhaps I've learned that I can transcend this. No matter how difficult life appeared to be, I got up and went and went to work anyway. I pushed through. So I can learn through my past experiences that I have the courage to continue. However, I want to continue without having to repeat this. So I've now learned what I want through what I don't want. I've learned what I really want to do through what I no longer want to do because I've experienced them and they didn't bring me joy and they didn't bring me state of peace and happiness. I no longer want to play that. So I forgive X, Y, Z that hurt me or X, Y, Z that planted these ideas in my head. I forgive the prejudices of my parents. I forgive the prejudices of my belief systems. Could it be religion or just ideology? And I let them go. I willingly let them go. And I adopt a new way of looking at it. I adopt a, a positive contribution, contributory way of looking at it. I want to contribute positively. Through playing out these roles, I realize my true passion, my true talents are these. These are the things that inspire me. These are the things that drive me. These are the things that ignite my spirit to passionately live. Those things no longer serve me. Those things make me unhappy. I may be good at them, but I no longer want to do that. I no longer want to be in abusive relationships. I no longer want to be in a society or have friends that are prejudicial, racist, sexist. I let go. I no longer want that. I don't want to be part of a group of people that make sexist jokes or laugh at the suffering of others. I now learn what I do want, what I really want to experience through the experience of what I don't want. In the circles of Advaita Vedanta, they call that the neti neti. I am this because I'm not that. I'm not that. I'm not. I let go. Through a process of deduction, my life has shown me what I don't want. Therefore, clearing a path for what I do want. And now that I passionately know what I do want, I look at my natural talent. And I become grateful for this natural talent that I have. These are my skills. These are my talents. This is my passionate nature. 
And I feel such gratitude for having experienced those pasts and recognizing I no longer wanting it, letting go of those hurtful experiences because they've brought me into a deeper understanding of who and what I am. And now I know what I want and that enhances and, and ri rises the state of gratitude. I'm now grateful for this newfound understanding. I'm so glad I went through that, no matter how hurtful it was. I no longer have to relive it because I let it go. I understand it. I forgive it. It's only in the past. Whatever trauma it is, it can only affect me if I replay it in the present. I choose to no longer look at it. I let it go. It's in the back. It's in the past. And so be it. And now knowing fully what I want to do, or maybe there's still an uncertainty of what I want to do. I at least know what I no longer want to do. And now I can put myself to practice. I can learn a new set, set of skills. I can learn a new profession, but I choose to passionately move forward with the past release. I'm no longer carrying the weight of the past in the present as I try and transcend whatever it is I want to do or achieve. And so forgiving the past, clearing the data comes through simply the acknowledgement that I've gained in wisdom. I now know more of what I am and what I want. And so I'm grateful for the past. I'm grateful for the hurt. No longer want to repeat it. And so I offer it thanks. I give it love. I offer it love. Thank you for showing me what I, what I am, what I meant to do. And then when I can abide in that gratitude, I sink into the heart symbolically. When I abide in that gratitude silently, I ask to be shown, where would you have me be? What would you have me do? Where would you have me go? How would you have me play out my passionate nature? When I sit silently, inspiration comes. And inspiration then gives us a very clear vision of what it is we're meant to do and how we're meant to do it. Now we're passionately meant to pour ourselves into life itself because the very essence of what we are can only be revealed passionately, inspirationally, when the filters of the past are gone because it's being revealed all the time, but it's being revealed through those filters. And so when we forgive the past, when we forgive the data, that pureness of essence flows through passionately. Now, there's many techniques for forgiveness. And first, it has to be the understanding. The understanding that transcends the filters of our identity. And the second, the second way of doing it is, is through gratitude and love. And so Ho'oponopono, for example, are such, such a good technique because it starts off with the saying, I'm sorry to the person that you may have hurt, or you're saying it to yourself for having had those painful past experiences. Thank you for now I see, and I've gained this newfound wisdom and understanding that had I not experienced those, those past traumatic experiences, that data, those filters, I wouldn't know this about myself. So thank you. Thank you to the person that hurt me. Thank you. Thank you. Even if I've hurt someone, thank you, because now I realize what I no longer want to be. I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. And you're, you're forgiving yourself for having undergone these years of forgetfulness where you're not aware of what you are, this passionate being that wants to pour itself knowingly into the world through its talented nature. And so you're, you're sorry to self for having not remembered this. You are spirit. You are spirit that is projected into body-mind. Your true immortal reality is reality of spirit, and spirit is the same essential nature as that which source, the source of its creation. And so I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. I love all these past experiences. I love all these people that have come into my life with prejudices, with ideologies that have held me back. Because as I sought to transcend them, as I chose to overcome them, I now realize my passionate nature. Thank you. I love you. 
thank you for having played that role. I love you because you're an extension of me. I am connected to the entire universe. I'm attached to nothing, but I'm connected to all of it. So thank you for coming into my life and playing out this role, which I needed to understand and, there, and thus transcend into this new level of understanding and knowing. And thus we are healed. I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. We are healed. I let you go. I release you healed. No more bondage. No more grievance towards that. Nothing to blame anymore. I let it go. And I'm now released to be this knowing, to be this passionate nature. Forgiveness has brought about a sense of gratitude. And this gratitude for what? For the newfound wisdom. I understand how the entire world, the entire universe, my universe, my world, plays out through me, through my passionate nature, for me, for the benefit of myself and all. There's always a glad exchange. I, I feel such gratitude, gratitude for being able to let go, clear the data. And once that data is clear, clear, completely clear, you will find and you will immediately recognize that sense of stillness, an all-pervading sense of gratitude, which will start a bubble up in an inspired, passionate way. And then you are ready to pour yourself out into this world. Forgiveness sets us free because forgiveness brings us to understanding and then transcends understanding into knowing. And once the, the self is known, the essence of the self is known, it is filled with passionate inspiration that plays out through our natural essential nature. And that natural essential nature in each human being, all 8 billion of us is uniquely played out through what we call our talent. And this is what you're meant to be. This is your contribution to the bigger picture. Forgiveness is that which serves the inspiration to being the unlimited potential of what you are. I hear you. And uh, what, I, what I hear when you're sharing is it's almost as if we can see the present moment through the eyes of the past rather than seeing it through the, the cleanness of, of just the present, right? The data-free present. Yeah. Well, pure awareness, which is the very essence of what we are, before we've made it ourselves into form, projected ourselves into form. Mm. Pure awareness to be known consciously here now. It has to be, it has to flow through zero filter. Mm. And the past and all those traumas are the filters that prevent the clear light of consciousness from shining through. Mm. Lewis, so like when we see like judgment or prejudice, I get that, right? That's data programming that needs to be cleared but when it comes to taking total responsibility I, I would like to ask you what about something like let's say someone gets mugged uh, someone loses a job right now if we have to take total responsibility then there's responsibility required in that experience as well and how how can one go about understanding this well, the only way we can do that is when we recognize that everything is there to serve my highest ideal. Now, that sounds incredibly <laughs> cruel if you say to somebody, just got mugged. Mm. The person, if I've just been mugged, I have to step back and say, where was I when this happened? Where was my thoughts? What was I feeling about myself? Mm. How was I attacking myself inwardly? through my own thinking, that the world manifested the attack on me. So all of these self-attacking thoughts have um, led directly to the external attack. Yeah. So if I pay close attention and I take full responsibility, it will very quickly bring me into the realization, where was my thoughts? Where was my mind? 
how was I attacking myself? How was I judging myself? How was I blaming myself for this to happen? Let's say you lose your job. Was I truly happy? Where were my thoughts? Were my thoughts filled with fearful thoughts of losing my job and the world just mirrored what I felt? Did I feel I wasn't contributing? Did I think I wasn't good enough? Or was I just so miserably unhappy that I made myself and everyone around me unhappy and, the hunts that, and henceforth they let me go? Why, you know, before I say, why did this happen to me? Why did I create this? How did, what was I doing that needed to see and experience this outer experience in order to bring me into the awareness of where are my thoughts? And sometimes things just happen randomly or so they appear. But if you investigate, you'll always realize that even the most traumatic thing that happened, losing your job, uh, being mugged, whatever the case may be, are actually serving your highest ideal when, when, because it's all forcing you to look at yourself and realize how are you processing? What is your relationship inwardly? What is your inner view of this world and your relationship to it? And it's trying to show you that there's an error there that you're beating yourself up, that you're attacking yourself, that you're abusing yourself, that you are willingly putting yourself in a position where you don't want to be there. You're unhappy about being there. You're unhappy and you're resisting what is. I mean, the, the beginning of all attack form thoughts happen as a, as a, as a resistance. I, I'm watching the world and I'm resisting what is. I'm resisting the virus. I'm resisting the war. I'm attacking the president. I'm attacking that country. I'm attacking that group of people. And so what I have is attack thoughts and attack thoughts come back at me in the world I've projected. And when I become conscious that the attack thoughts are in me and therefore are being projected through my filters into the world, they're going to come back at me as those things that appear to attack me. And so if I take full responsibility for my thinking and where I place my thoughts, and where am I in the past, in the present, projected into the future? Or am I truly present? Being present in the, in, to now, filled with the stories and, and thoughts of the past, I'm just going to recreate it. So if I take full responsibility, can I clear the slate and be fully present in awareness here and allow, without resistance, to what is? And now passionately pour myself with inspired thoughts into the world. So it requires it, it asking us to take responsibility. And when we can see the consequential actions that appeared in the past of the way we were thinking prior to those actions, we will realize that we alone are responsible for everything that happens to us. I am the creator of my reality, right? Absolutely. One of them for, for me has been like a journey with, with lack and understanding abundance. And as you're speaking, and then I see that where, where are you in that, that, that fear of not having and the, the fear of not having enough at the end of a certain month. And it's like, yeah. well, you were there. So it's playing out in front of the screen of your awareness. And, and people will often say, but it's hard, Lesh, this is hard. How can you, you know, how do you do this? How can you expect us to do this? It's a concerted mm -hmm. effort. If we think about how many times or how much time we spend thinking negative thoughts mm -hmm. or resisting what is, and it's become natural for us to have this wrong-minded approach, we need to move into a right-minded approach. We need to move into positive conscious awareness takes effort because we've spent our entire lives programming wrong-minded thinking. And yes, it is difficult, but it requires you to spend some quiet time contemplation, in contemplation, in conscious awareness, not just meditating. You meditate simply to clear the thoughts and become present. When you're present, you allow that inspiration to come through and you clear the data. In that present conscious awareness, clear the data. And then the more you clear the data, the more the inspiration comes through. And now I take full responsibility again. And if I choose to take full responsibility 
for pouring my passionate nature into the world, very quickly it'll prove to me that's where I'm meant to be because truth wants to be known and it wants to be shown. Just as much as illusions do, just as much as erroneous thinking does. Ego mind wants to prove itself true. So it'll keep recreating your past trauma in order for it to stay alive as an identity of yourself in the past in relationship to others. And that's the ego. It wants to stay alive. And so it will just keep attacking you with beliefs of fear and scarcity and unworthiness and rejection. And more scarcity and more scarcity and more scarcity. Ego loves scarcity. In order to keep you bound emotionally to itself, its identity, again, images in the past, and henceforth reproject them into the future. The ego fears its death, which means you letting go of your identification with those body-mind debilitating belief systems and prejudices and traumas. The minute you let that go, what happens to the identity? It dissolves in the light of this newfound awareness. And now, in this newfound conscious awareness, you pour yourself passionately into your creation without ever worrying about scarcity again. Why? Because when you're passionately pouring yourself into what, what you are, there are no thoughts of scarcity. There's only thoughts of creation. There's only thought, abundant thoughts of creation. Abundant thoughts. Takes practice. Absolutely. It isn't easy. It takes effort. But you have, one has to ask oneself, would I rather do this, put this conscious effort into it, or do I want to relive the past? And the answer always comes clearly. If the current misery isn't that bad, if the current misery is less intense than the fear of the future, well, we stay in our misery and love to complain because we're getting attention by complaining. Mm. When the fear of the future is a whole lot less is the current of the, than the current misery and the current suffering, then we'll gladly move. And again, it's a glad exchange because it's the letting go. You cannot move into a new, positive, joyful, peaceful future if you're projecting that future from the past through the filters of fear, guilt, and sin. Those filters have to be cleared so that this passionate nature, which is the very essence of yourself, can pour out through inspired vision. And so forgiveness, clearing data, ho'oponopono, non-duality teachings like A Course in Miracles, are phenomenal tools. Every good religion is based on forgiveness because it's the letting go of. It was the great teacher Jesus said, I seek mercy, forgiveness, not sacrifice. So these teachings have been around forever. We now have to consciously practice them. And, and that means letting go of the data, taking full responsibility that I am the creator, the projector of my reality. And so I therefore choose to take full responsibility and project through a clear lens with no history, no trauma, no past attached. That past trauma history has been replaced with gratitude, newfound wisdom, clarity of what, I, what it is I want to do and what I am and how I want to express myself. Gratitude because as the past, it's brought about this newfound understanding. And now I pour myself knowingly with full responsibility and love my creation. Thank you, Lewis. I, I really, really appreciate that. And just your sharing around a really big topic and an important one. Yeah, again, thank you for this opportunity, Ryan. And um, I'll post this out tomorrow and let's hope that this word spreads and I know that this can benefit many people. Thank you. Thanks, Lewis.